Boa tarde. Nós vamos para a última atividade é, do nosso encontro e será uma conferência feita pelo Ronald Brashear sobre cultura material ligada com a história da ciência. Uh, e Ronald, ele é formado em física, fez o um mestrado em física, mas quando ele estava no doutorado, ele foi fisgado pela história da ciência e não largou mais é, desse anzol. É, e teve um, uma chance muito é, particular, que foi ser é, um funcionário é, da Fundação Huntington, que tem é, na Califórnia, que tem uma grande biblioteca, onde ele organizou os livros de história da ciência e da técnica. Depois disso... Ele esteve no Smithsonian, em Washington, a capital, aonde ele chegou a ser o bibliotecário encarregado do legado do Ben Dibner, que foi um industrial muito importante, que era apaixonado pelo Leonardo da Vinci e, por causa disso, começou a colecionar livros antigos de física, química, biologia, tecnologia em geral, e criou um acervo é, fantástico. É, e é, depois se tornou um historiador, escreveu vários livros sobre é, personagens e assuntos da história da ciência, e deixou é, o legado dele, a biblioteca, com uma coleção enorme, mais de 10 mil livros foram para o Smithsonian, e também manuscritos, cartas, bilhetes, anotações diversas de cientistas desde o Renascimento até o século XX. E essa biblioteca, Dibner, favoreceu a vinda de vários pesquisadores, inclusive do Brasil, e, depois disto, ele foi assumir um lugar na biblioteca da Fundação para o Patrimônio da Química, em Filadélfia. E este era um lugar também muito especial, porque, mantido por indústrias químicas americanas e europeias, se concentrou inicialmente exatamente na história da química, da alquimia, enfim, os precursores, e é, foi aos poucos sendo muito mais genérica, abracando toda a história da ciência. E a, essa fundação é, recentemente se tornou um instituto de história da ciência nos Estados Unidos, que é praticamente o maior é, lugar que concentra pesquisas de história da ciência, também com uma biblioteca enorme e uma coleção de artefatos, no caso, basicamente da química, ou ligados à história da química. É, tem, portanto, um museu e é, faz muitas atividades culturais. É, Filadélfia é um centro, é, vamos dizer, geopolítico da história da ciência nos Estados Unidos, porque está perto de várias outras instituições importantes é, não só a Universidade da Pensilvânia, que fica em Filadélfia mesmo, mas da grande, grande, grande área em volta é, da Pensilvânia, indo, portanto, é, toda a costa leste e, e também congregando pesquisadores, na verdade, do mundo inteiro, para é, fazendo pesquisas e darem é, conferências, seminários e também Uh, um lugar bastante importante que dá bolsas de estudo para uh, quem é pesquisador na história da ciência. Então, uh, com vocês, o Ronald. Thank you, Gildo. Uh, I want to and thank you for that introduction. I want to thank the uh, organizers and especially Gildo for the invitation to speak with you today. I'm also very thankful that they allowed me to speak in English. 
My Portuguese is not very good. <laughs> Almost non-existent, so that would be a difficult thing. So I appreciate your willingness to listen to me in English. <clears throat> I'm honored to be a part of this very fine and stimulating Congress. Uh, I want to talk to you today about why primary sources and archives are so important for the history of science. As you can see from my title, which I've extended, it's now preserving the heritage of modern science and technology. I don't want to leave technology out. Uh, but the modern period, uh, for me, I will focus on the later portion of the modern era, mostly the 19th century and later, but I will include the early modern period on occasion. <clears throat> Basically, my talk is about the fact that we can't do history without the records of the people who made history. These can be written records, recordings, and material culture. Uh, it's all included. My, my talk will attempt to cover as much as possible about how the history of science and technology is being preserved, but I'll use my own experiences and the places where I have worked as a case study in what is being done and what might be done in the future. <clears throat> in the end, this could be a sad story or a happy story. How it ends depends to a large part on us. How we preserve the history of science depends on individuals as well as institutions, governments, and philanthropy. So, <clears throat> so I'll start first with a little bit uh, about my background and the institutions in which I've worked. Gildo has told you a little bit, actually quite a lot, about, uh, about my background, but let's, uh, let's go back to that for where it all started for me. <clears throat> As a, uh, someone who started in physics and astrophysics and then in history of science, uh, I discovered that it was very difficult to get a job in the history of science, but an opportunity arose where I could use my expertise in the history of science, at that time particularly the history of astronomy, at an institution that I had never heard of before. This is the Huntington Library, which is located in California, very near Pasadena, very near Caltech. And that's where my story starts. Uh, since then, I've been involved with libraries dedicated to the history of science and technology for 31 years. Professionally, I've been a manuscripts curator, a rare books curator, and a library director. And in this uh, story, independent research libraries are important. They have no agendas, only pressures from donors and supporters. In the case of the Huntington Library, this was founded in 1919 by one man, Henry Huntington, whose legacy was this building, his art collection, and his rare book collection, which was originally about the history of American and British uh, culture and society and literature. They did nothing in history of science. But there was one person, the library director, who was very interested in the history of science. The problem was nobody else at the Huntington Library was interested in the history of science. But he persisted, and he managed to hire me to work there as the first curator of the history of science and technology. And it was a very, it's an interesting place. If, if you've never been to the Huntington Library, it is the largest independent research library in the United States. It is the largest supporter of the humanities in the United States. It has art collections, botanical gardens, and a research library where hundreds of people come to use the collection. <clears throat> it's a very busy place. Um, as you can see in the reading room where you consult rare books and manuscripts, there is a lot of space for people to come. During the summertime, the room is absolutely filled. Sometimes you, uh, there's no room for you, so you have to make an appointment to use the collections. <clears throat> but 
I started doing history of science there, and the problem was is that they never identified as a history of science collection. What I did was show them that within their hundreds of thousands, close to 600,000 rare books and 7 million manuscripts, that if they looked closely, they could find science. And this was a revelation to them. They never thought of themselves as a science history of science library, yet in their collections they had thousands of scientific books. Only because they had been collecting so many books, they didn't notice every now and then a science book would sneak in. So after 75 years, they had an amazing collection of science, and I showed them that it existed there. They really didn't understand it. And this opened my eyes to the fact that science is an integral part of our society and our culture. If you collect a library all about British history and American history, there will be science in it. Without science, we wouldn't have the society and culture that we live in. So for me, the main point of my career was to make sure that the history of science was not something you just studied as an intellectual curiosity on its own, but that the history of science and technology needed to be integrated into all of our historical studies. It's not just about the history of wars and battles, the history of kings and queens, the history of social movements, cultural movements, that all of these were integrated with science and technology. And that's one reason why I think the history of science is so important, not just because science is important in and of itself, but because it is one of the major impacts on life as we know it. So I worked there for 10 years, telling them all of the science materials they had, even acquiring additional science materials. And then uh, I wanted to have a, a larger impact, so I needed to find uh, another position where I could expand my own interests and passions. And this was the Dibner Library of the History of Science and Technology at the Smithsonian Institution. This is actually in the Museum of American History, if you have ever been there. One reason why I liked this place uh, it, instead of the Huntington was because of its focus on the history of science and technology. All of the materials there were about this topic and it uh, was a much better collection uh, at the time than what you would find at the Huntington. This was all like the Huntington, which was originally the collection of one man, Henry Huntington. The Dibner Library was collected originally by one man, Bern Dibner, who in 1974 uh, gave his best books about 10,000 of his rarest books to the United States at the Smithsonian Institution. So here was a place where you could focus on the history of science and technology in a museum called the American History Museum in which you could show that all of the exhibits in the museum were about American society, American culture, but in a little corner in the museum, you would find a place of history and science and technology. That history and science and technology was comfortable in a museum about American history. It didn't, it wasn't out of place, it belonged there. Uh, the United States would not exist the way it does today without the impact of science and technology upon it. So, as a work experience, it was great. It had a great collection. Uh, wonderful material, but the Smithsonian is a large institution and it had many, many priorities. History of science and technology was not a major priority, so it was sometimes frustrating uh, to work there. But there was a lot of independence. Yes, it's a government, it's considered a government institution, but it's actually not a government institution. It's a private institution that's run by the government. So you can sometimes get away with uh, 
your own, you're doing your own thing, and you don't have any government pressures upon you too much. Uh, but occasionally, um, there are certain issues. You can talk about evolution in our exhibit gallery, but you have to be careful when you talk about things like climate change. <laughs> it depends on, you know, you don't want to draw attention to yourself sometimes. So we focused more on the early history of science. Galileo, he's not too controversial now. Back then, yes, but now, not so much. Isaac Newton, perfectly fine. But uh, when you get into the modern science and technology, there are people with opinions that um, made it sometimes uh, an interesting place to work. <clears throat> but once again, to not be the focus of the entire institution was problematic. So I was there for eight years, <clears throat> and then I found an opportunity to move on to <coughs> where I am now, the Science History Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, here you can see the building. The uh, structure on the left is the original bank building, uh, which houses our museum and library space. The center, the tall center portion, mostly offices, and this section on the right is an auditorium. It is a place dedicated to the history of science and technology from top to bottom. That is its primary mission. This is, if you love history of science, to be here where all you are is about history of science and technology. It's the wonderful place to be. I was very happy uh, to go there. Um, but how does a place like this come to exist? Why is there a science history institute? Who, who in their right mind would create such a thing? Um, and that's an interesting history of itself. How do the institutions that preserve the history of science, how do they come to be? And there are not very many of them, but here's the history of one of them. So how did we come to be? Well, once again, the physicists were first. The uh, the American Physical Society decided that there needed to be a history of physics center. So they assigned the publishing arm, the American Institute of Physics, to establish a center for the history of physics. This was in 1961. This is a history of physics center that is established by a scientific society. So here's an internal look by scientists. If you have enough physicists come together and agree that history is important, eventually they will start uh, a center for that specific purpose. And they did that in 1961. So what happened then? Well, shortly thereafter, the American Institute of Physics realized that the chemists had much more money than the physicists. This is uh, true in the United States. Uh, it happens because chemists like to go into business and make a lot of money. Physicists not, don't do it as much. They do it some, but not as much. So in the 1970s, the American Institute of Physics uh, asked the American Chemical Society if they would like to join forces. Would you like to have a center for the history of physics and chemistry? Notice it's the history of physics and chemistry, not the history of chemistry and physics. This was uh, their question. And the chemist's answer was no. We like to be different. We like to be separate from the physicists. We actually have a very rich history, and we can do this ourselves. <clears throat> but this put pressure on the American Chemical Society, so they had to start their very own center for the history of chemistry. <clears throat> and they did this uh, in 1982. They created what became the Center for the History of Chemistry, and it was based in Philadelphia. Okay, why Philadelphia? I mean, the United States is a big country, not as big as Brazil, perhaps, but big. You know, why Philadelphia? <clears throat> uh, one reason, this, uh, if, you look, if you can look closely at this map of Philadelphia, it's a map of industrial Philadelphia. All around the periphery of the map, are images of factories and industrial plants. Indeed, Philadelphia was a highly industrialized city and one of the centers of the American chemical industry. So one logical reason is that 
Philadelphia has a strong history of the chemical industry. It should be the place where you have a center for the history of chemistry. Another reason was this man. <coughs> I don't think any of you here have heard of Edgar Foss Smith. Maybe some of you have. The historians of chemistry are nodding their heads. He's an interesting uh, figure. He was a professor of analytical chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and then he eventually became the chair of the department. <coughs> and he was uh, uh, became a very senior figure at the University of Pennsylvania, which is in Philadelphia. He became the vice provost, then the provost, and was very interested in what he called historical chemistry. Uh, in his work as a teacher, he liked to tell his students, to remind his students of the humanistic side of science and to counter what he saw as an overly commercial approach to scientific training. He wanted it to be more humanistic, not as much commercial. He chose to emphasize the moral aspects of their work rather than focusing solely on the development of skilled technicians. So he talked a lot about the history of chemistry to humanize it. Um, he was the co-founder of the American Chemical Society's History of Chemistry Division. He served as president of the American Chemical Society, the American Philosophical Society, and during his lifetime, he accumulated a collection of about 3,000 books, 600 manuscripts, along with antique furniture, portraits of chemists, and other memorabilia. After his death in 1928, his widow donated all of his collection with an endowment to support it to the University of Pennsylvania. So another reason to select Philadelphia was it had a great collection of the history of chemistry in the university library. The collection opened in 1931 and uh, is now a national historical chemical landmark. So here we have uh, Philadelphia, a great uh, library in history of chemistry, a great history of industrial chemistry. And then the final reason why we would go to um, Philadelphia is this man, Arnold Thackeray, who was um, the department chair of the history and sociology of science at the University of Pennsylvania. He was the curator of the Edgar Foss Smith collection at the university. And his idea was that if the American Chemical Society wants to start a center for history of chemistry, it must be in Philadelphia. For him, there was no other alternative. You have to have it here. We're the best source of history about it. And eventually, the American S Chemical Society agreed, and they had a party celebrating the Center for the History of Chemistry at Penn. The nice, uh, the nice thing about this is they're drinking probably alcohol, which has a nice histor history of chemistry nature to it. Right? Without chemistry, we would not have anything to celebrate uh, events like this. So it, it, it shows the value of the history of chemistry in general, but that's a little side note. This was a long effort. Um, the members of the American Chemical Society looked for different places, but the support provided by the University of Pennsylvania led them to see this indeed was the best choice. And it turned out that there were a lot of other people in Philadelphia who were very interested in supporting the Center for the History of Chemistry. Mostly, once again, chemists who went into business and made a lot of money became older and started to worry about how their legacy would be represented in history. So can they find a way in which the legacy of their own business and activity and the legacy of the discipline that helped make them wealthy, could that be a place that they could support? And the answer was most certainly yes. Because in 1982, when the Center for History of Chemistry was founded, it had a staff of one person, Arnold Thackeray, and his students. They were based in a little office in the university library. And so you can't do very much to support and preserve the history of chemistry with just one man and his students. They can do a lot of good, but they, there's only so much they can do. So what Arnold Thackeray did was realize 
he met with these wealthy people who were chemists. And the first example of his success <coughs> was what became the Beckman Center for the History of Chemistry. <coughs> On the right in this image, you can see Arnold Beckman at the center and to, to the right of him, uh, Mabel Beckman. These two, uh, <coughs> Arnold Beckman may be most remembered as an inventor. He left his post at Caltech to run a business. He's best known for inventing the electronic pH meter, but he's also involved in si developing scientific uh, instrumentation for blood analysis, for oxygen analysis, also for uh, analyzing the exhausts of automobiles. So he made more money than he could give away. He, he wanted to give away all of his money before he died, but he did not succeed. This is how you know you're very wealthy, when you can't give away your money faster than you make it. So in the end, uh, before he passed away, he set up the Arnold and Mabel Beckman Foundation, and they gave $2 million to the Center for the History of Chemistry, which allowed us to name it the Arnold and Mabel Beckman Center for the History of Chemistry. And if you got $2 million, you'd be smiling like Arnold Thackeray is in this picture as well. You'll also notice, you may not be able to read it, but the triangular logo has three names around it. Uh, on the top is, Ameri on the top left, American Chemical Society. Going down on the right, University of Pennsylvania. Then on the bottom, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. The chemical engineers wanted to be a part of this, not just the chemists. The chemical engineers said, we need to be a part of it. And, and also, our name needs to be at the bottom, because the engineers are the foundation of, of chemistry. So they got their name at the bottom. Now, so this is great. You have $2 million. You can move out of the tiny room in the library at the University of Pennsylvania. You start, you build, you get offices next to the university, and you, begin, you are able to do things. Uh, you're able to do historical programs and to excite the community. But <clears throat> little did we know that along with the Beckman Center for the History of Chemistry, we ran into a man named Donald Othmer. And Donald Othmer was upset that, uh, that Arnold Beckman gave $2 million to the Center for Street Chemistry, but nobody asked him for money. He was even wealthier than Arnold Beckman. He was a chemist, actually a chemical engineer, excuse me, a chemical engineer. He taught at the Brooklyn Polytechnic University, and he uh, was a consulting engineer on the side. And he invested his money with a young man named Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett turned his investment of about $200,000 into about $800 million. And when Donald Othmer died in 1995, and when his wife Mildred died, they gave away their money. He was more successful at giving away his money than Arnold Beckman. He gave away everything. And he gave over $100 million to the Center for History of Chemistry. Why? To start a library. He was concerned that chemistry library in New York was um, not being supported enough and he didn't want to give all of his money to this small little organization in New York. So he said, I want to give the money to this place in Philadelphia because I believe it has the ability to manage a library. So the books from the Chemist Club of New York were transferred to the Center for History of Chemistry in 1988, and now there is a Othmer Library of Chemical History, started one year after the Beckman Center for the History of Chemistry. But the two centers were equal. The Beckman Center was one part, the Othmer Library was another part, and so what they did was essentially create a new uh, institution to cover both of them, and that became the Chemical Heritage Foundation designated for the history of chemistry and chemical engineering and all of the other disciplines that are interested in the chemical and molecular nature of matter. And finally, in 2015, we merged with another 
History of Science Institution called the Life Sciences Foundation in San Francisco, and that created the Science History Institute. And this is a warning for preserving the history of science and technology because in probably around 2010, the Life Sciences Foundation was started in California. The idea was just like the History of Chemistry Center, to get the people in the modern life sciences, in biotechnology, to build their own legacy, to create a historical center that would have collections. The problem was, we think, that biotechnology was too new. There wasn't a sense of a long legacy of biotechnology. So this institution, unfortunately, was unable to uh, maintain itself. There wasn't enough funding coming in. So what was going to happen to the history of biotechnology? Was it going to disappear? Well, unfortunately, uh, the, that was what was possible. However, at the last minute, the group decided, asked if they could merge with the Center for History of Chemistry. So we now have an institution that does the history of chemistry, chemical engineering, and the modern life sciences. Unfortunately, there's not one word to cover all three of those, so we called it the Science History Institute. And so now we have a place where um, since uh, 2018, last year, a place that is now designed to support the history of all of the sciences that study the chemical and molecular nature of stuff. If we're interested in the history of matter, how it, what makes up matter, uh, how we came to understand the nature of matter, how we manipulate matter, how we use it in everyday experience, and how we dispose of it. All of this life cycle of matter is the interest of the Science History Institute, and it can fall under any discipline that studies matter. It can be the history of physics, it can be the history of uh, geochemistry, history of biology. All of these things are of interest to us. So we stand as a place that can uh, perhaps be very significant in helping preserve the history of science. We can't do it all by ourselves, but we can partner with places like the Center for History of Physics and some other institutions that specialize in science and technology to help preserve that. Now, how do we preserve that at the Institute? Well, first off, there's the library. And our facility, uh, you see here, has a large reading room. It's set up for um, a special event, but we also have people there who do research. Um, they use the library, which consists now of about 150,000 books, and uh, archives, which consist of, um, well, we like to say about five, about four miles of shelves of books and archives. You can do the conversion to kilometers. Uh, and uh, so, so it's a large, rich collection that we use to support research in the history of science, mostly chemical and molecular sciences. Now, it started to show you how young we are. The library was founded in 1988, but we didn't move into this building until 1995. And we didn't catalog our books until 1997. And the reading room you see here wasn't built until the year 2000. So really, we have only been a library for less than 20 years. So you may not have heard of us. Many people haven't. That's just because we're quite new. But we feel like we, ha we are in a good position to use our resources to help preserve the history of science and technology. So, the start of the Othmer Library collection was the collection of the Chemist Club of New York. And this was mostly the collection of the history of the chemical industry, but they also had some rare books which l talked about the history of how chemistry was done in the early Renaissance, early modern period. That's a small collection, but what happened in 2004 is we acquired another rare book collection from a collector in California who had about 
5,000 rare books in the history of chemistry and alchemy. So like this book, which is from uh, Andreas Lebavius's Alchemia, the first real textbook in chemistry uh, from the, around the year 1600, became part of our collection. But also the Neville Collection had many more riches later on. It had collections from the 18th century. This is an engraving from Lavoisier's treatise on chemistry from 1798, where Lavoisier collected his, created his own instruments to essentially help quantify and turn chemistry into a truly quantifiable science. And it was a true team with Lavoisier and his wife, Polze Lavoisier, uh, you may not be able to see this, but at the lower right of the engraving is a little note that says, Pulls a Lavoisier imprimatur. So his wife drew all of the drawings for his chemical textbook. Also, <clears throat> uh, we the rare books even go into what might not be considered rare in the traditional sense, but into the, into the 19th century. For example, this is a very rare book, the Osniovi Kimi of Dmitry Mendeleev. The first edition, first volume was published in St. Petersburg in 1869. And on the right, you see the first appearance in his textbook of a very uh, preliminary form of his periodic table of the chemical elements. This book is very rare. Even though it was a textbook written in the 19th century, very few copies exist. I, there was no copy at the Huntington Library. There was no copy at the Dibner Library. Finally, I was in an institution that had Mendeleev's textbook. The second volume has the more, uh, a little more modern appearance of the periodic table. And you can even see the blank spaces in there in wh where he is predicting additional chemical elements based on a particular uh, atomic weight. So, so this collection from the early modern to the modern period is really available for people to come and do research. <clears throat> but what makes the collection valuable is not just that we have the highlights of the rare books, but we have thousands of them. The rare books of the the famous rare books and the not so famous rare books. The books by the famous scientists and the not so famous scientists. It's a critical mass of material that when you go there, you can begin to mine this material and find more things than you ever expected to find. So what we realize is that for a history of science library, you need to have breadth, you need to cover a very many areas, and you have to have a depth. You need to cover them in great detail. You don't have just one edition of a book, you have all of the editions of a book to see how the science knowledge changed as uh, the book changed. And you also need to have the translations of these books. Nope, the reason the Osnovi Kimi is so rare is because it was only used in Russia. It had to be translated into German, into French, into English before other scientists became aware of what Mendeleev was saying. And when you translate a book, you change things. You add your own perspectives as translator. And so if we want to know how the Germans understood Mendeleev, we have to have the German translation of the book, not the Russian first edition. So, we have, so this is our goal at the Institute, is to have as much coverage in this area that we possibly can. <clears throat> Then in 2013, we moved into manuscripts. A collection in the Netherlands became available and for $300,000, we were able to purchase this collection of early manuscripts on chemistry. And this now made us quickly one of the largest collections of manuscripts in chemistry in the United States. Since then, we have been purchasing more and more manuscripts. Just a few years ago, we purchased this manuscript, which is in the handwriting of Isaac Newton, who was, of course, one of the great alchemists of the, uh, of the early modern period. We particularly like this manuscript because the very top line, the title of the manuscript is The Preparation of the Stone of Mercury by the Star Regulus of Antimony from the Manuscript of the American Philosopher. 
So we thought an American institution should have a manuscript written by Isaac Newton where he's taking notes from an American philosopher, who we now know is a fellow named George Starkey, who was born in Bermuda, educated in Harvard, then moved to London and became an alchemist there. And Newton was very interested in this because he felt that by studying this manuscript, he would be able to make the philosopher's stone. And Newton was interested in alchemy because he was interested in the occult arts. If you're interested in gravity, gravity is an occult force. It is dark, mysterious. You don't understand it. If you understand how alchemy works, you maybe get some insight into how gravity works. So it made a lot of sense in the early modern period to have something like that. So we are collecting these manuscripts as well because um, we now are building a critical mass of this material. But that's early manuscripts. The most important part of our collection that people study in great numbers are the archival collections. These are the actual records of the scientists themselves, the institutions, the companies, the organizations, the societies. This is the material that does not appear in the scientific publications. This is the heart of history. It, this is where science feels like their published record is the final version. As historians, we're interested in how, how they got to that final version. And this is collected in the records of the scientists themselves, in their correspondence, in their notebooks, in, and we're also interested in the organization of science. How does science organize itself? How does it decide what disciplines exist? And so, so we have to have that. But the problem with archives, especially the papers of the 19th and 20th century, is that they are enormous. You're just looking here at a small portion of the records of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. We have kilometers and kilometers of shelves holding these archives. We ran out of room um, in the early 2000s. And the problem when you are trying to preserve the history and heritage of modern science is that this material just keeps growing and the institution needs to grow to accommodate all of this material. If you do not build, have an institution that grows, that continues to expand, to acquire more things, then you don't collect it. The material gets lost, it gets thrown away. You need to have a way to preserve it. So for us, this meant building a new facility just for archives. And you can see on our, in our facility adjacent to it, we built a building just for archival storage. Nothing else, no people work in there, it's just to store material. The shelves go up about, um, oh, 10 meters or so. And it was built just for new expansion. In the image on the right, uh, the two people, the person on the left, that person on the left gave us the money to build that building. It gave us about $4 million. So this is the key, is to find out that the fact in the United States there are individuals who are very interested in the history of science. And if you have an institution that does a good job of preserving them, they will support you. And so we now have this building. It's already 25% full with material we've uh, collected more and more. And we feel like in 20, 25 years, it will be entirely full. So before that happens, we have to start planning to build the next building and then the building after that and so on. So this is a never ending issue for institutions designed to preserve this material. Now you may say, well, you know, all of our material is becoming digital. You know, you don't need shelves for digital storage. And I do agree that is correct. But the problem is, is that there's more and more paper material out there to collect. Just because we're in the 21st century now doesn't mean there isn't 19th, 20th century and other material that remains to be collected. There are also other libraries that 
can no longer sustain themselves and go out of business. We have to be there to acquire the collections of other libraries that can no longer exist. So it's a never ending cycle. So yes, we need more room. Now, and I mentioned the archives, um, they collect all sorts of interesting material uh, related to the history of science and technology. This is a letter from Niels Bohr to Jean Gerard, the Secretary General of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, uh, talking about the organization of that particular union. So the correspondence of scientists, very important to learn what they're thinking and how they're planning things. There are also uh, documents such as uh, this particular one, which talks about, this is the document owned by Arnold Beckman in which this is about the air pollution problem in Los Angeles. And Arnold Beckman is there to solve air pollution in Los Angeles through his scientific instrumentation. So he is going to take notes on this and give it back to the policy people to show them how to solve a, a problem of society with technology. This is all in our archives. There's also stuff that is not meant to be kept, stuff that is meant to be thrown away. Uh, ephemeral material, like the calling card of Louis Pasteur, in which he's even wrote a little note in his own handwriting at the bottom. These are things that we love to collect, things that were meant to be thrown away, but we managed to get it before it was. Historians love this material. We have manuals on how to operate scientific instruments. It's one thing to collect a scientific instrument in a museum, but it's another thing to know how it operates. If you look at a scientific instrument 100 years from now, how do you know how it works? Well, the people who used it have, are dead. So you need to have some way of, of connecting with that material culture object. So we have instrumentation manuals. We also are interested in how science and technology is presented to a large public. So we collect advertisements. Here's an advertisement uh, on how you can use DDT to destroy insects in your home. And it's sort of interesting how the company, in this case Hercules, is uh, demonstrating a, uh, a chemical product for use in the home, how it's safe and how uh, it will make your life better. In retrospect, it's interesting to see how DDT was marketed at that time. It was a very effective agent, <coughs> a little too effective, perhaps. <clears throat> also things that were meant to be thrown away are postage stamps. We have a very large collection of postage stamps about science and technology. And this is very important because it, here we see how society uh, represents science. The decisions on what gets put on stamps are not made by the scientists. Generally, it's made by governments. It's made by bureaucrats. It's made by the public in terms of voting. Do you want a skinny Elvis or a fat Elvis on your stamp? Do you want Niels Bohr or do you want a lovely bird on your stamp? So these are the types of things that give us some insight into how societies and how governments portray science. And it's a uh, so this is the sort of thing, if you put all of these things in context, give you a rich nature. So the idea of preserving the history of science and technology is not about just the printed papers, not just about the archives, but it's about everything that was about science. Without that, you don't get a complete picture of what the history of science and technology meant to uh, people in general. Now, um, you also don't just preserve the paper records of history of science, you have to also preserve the material culture. And this is done through history of science museums. So in addition to a library, in 2008, our institute started a museum. And this was in general to help organize and manage our collections of museum objects that we had, but also to share them through exhibitions with the public. Because the one thing we've learned is that if you only engage with scientists and historians of science, you are engaging a very small group of people. The ones who sometimes make the decisions on the future of your institution 
are not the scientists and, and the uh, historians necessarily, but the public who votes on people who may determine where your funding comes from. So it's very important for an institution to preserve the history of science, to engage with the public. You have to show the public why science and technology is important to them in ways they might not ever realize. So our exhibits are about how scientists make instruments, how these instruments became household uses, how your smartphone is a product of science and technology that if you think about it, um, has a very interesting and difficult history. So you see in our museum here, which is a, a, a top level museum, in the center there's a table where people can interact uh, with some of the images of objects in our collections and see how they all interconnect with each other. There are uh, exhibits showing scientific instruments and along the walls on the first floor, everyday products from plastic to color textiles to electric light bulbs and to show the science and technology history behind them. On the top, uh, on the top level is more about how, how scientists are educated, how you become a scientist, and what science has meant in terms of industry uh, and commercial nature to our world. So it's an opportunity to engage with the public, and this is critical. If you have an institute that doesn't do that, then it's very difficult to build the support you need to survive. What we like about our particular museum is that you see the exhibits are open. They're not behind glass, so people can get up to them. You're not supposed to touch them, uh, but you can feel more engaged with them. We were worried about that. We were worried that people would start touching all of the objects. But what we found is that people are very respectful. If you tell them you're in a museum, they're very careful about touching it. The people who we have trouble with uh, are the scientists. <laughs> because they will look at an instrument on display and they said, oh, I had one of these in my laboratory and start fiddling with the knobs and switches. So we have to tell them, no, that's a museum piece. And they're very disappointed to find out that an instrument they worked on is now in a museum. This is a problem. It shows that um, this is the nature of getting scientists interested in history that there is a very contemporary history and that uh, we are interested not just in the ancient, beautiful artifacts of the 19th century, but the very homegrown artifacts that they worked with. So, so our history doesn't stop at an early period. It continues up to the present day because this is the material that people deal with on an everyday basis and they want to know the history of the things that they're aware of. So the museum is very important and is also very rich in materials. Our collections contain scientific instruments like this uh, spectrograph from the early 20th century. We, they, we have chemistry sets, which people may be aware from their early years. This is how they became interested in science, playing with chemistry sets. We have uh, scientific apparatus, uh, light bulbs, uh, which uh, a nice collection of light bulbs and uh, computer chips. <clears throat> we also have uh, molecular model kits, things that uh, scientists use to build three-dimensional representations of chemical models. <laughs> and we also have, what some people are surprised of, is uh, artworks. We have a great collection of fine art with, with scientific uh, images on them. This is an example of a, of a piece of art from about the year 1680. It's called The Alchemist. And you can see an alchemist here studying a flask in his hand with books spread all over the place. He's a very messy alchemist. And this indeed was the point of view of Dutch art in the 17th century, was to show that alchemy is a messy science and something that you should not take part in if you're a normal human being. You'd have to be crazy to be an alchemist. And this was a genre of art at the time. So we have fine art in our collection as well. So once again, like our paper records, which covers a huge breadth of it, for the material culture of science, you have to collect as much as possible, not just one small aspect of it. With this, you can show the broad reach of science and technology into our society and culture. 
Now, finally, um, here's the one thing that is a modern uh, tradition, and this is oral histories. These uh, were developed not in the history of science originally, but in the history of, of society and culture. Basically, you would go to people who were people who were not famous people, but people who had an impact or were impacted by science. People whose stories would never get told by, because they weren't famous. So in science, we have the same issue. We have everybody celebrates the famous scientists, the ones who win the Nobel Prizes, the ones who get awards. But we don't always remember the scientists and the graduate students who worked with them and the technical people that built the instruments for them. Or in the case of the early 20th century, the women who did all the calculations for science who weren't allowed to be scientists. So the, era, the idea here is to, is to meet with these people and to take, to record their memories of what their life was like as a child, how they became interested in science, how they became either a scientist or a technician uh, or a computer, and how their life was affected either positively or negatively by who they were. And so we started a center uh, for oral history, which um, essentially is going around as, as much as funding allows to do interviews with people whose stories might not be told. And we now have several hundred of these oral histories, and we're uh, and these are uh, these are available for researchers to to use. Now, the one thing we've realized is that our institution by itself cannot do all the oral histories we need to do. The Center for History of Physics is also doing oral histories, but they can't do enough. So what we've started to do is do oral history training. We now provide training to individuals interested in learning how to do oral history, how to do research interview methodologies, and, uh, and we provide this training at locations in different parts of the country if they have enough interest in uh, developing these oral histories. So as an example, in the next in the summer, we're having three institutes at North Carolina State University, at the Science History Institute, and at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's a week-long training event where you learn how to do an oral history. And the idea is that perhaps once you do an oral history for your project, then you can deposit it at our institution where we can preserve it. Uh, and if you do it according to standard methodologies, then it will be really helpful to historians besides yourselves. And the, my colleagues in the Oral History Center said, if you're interested in having a training institute here in Sao Paulo, please let us know, and we'd be interested in working with you um, to set this up. Um, but in any event, uh, I want to now just say, <clears throat> so these are the three main collecting areas of our institute, but these should be the focus of any place preserving the history of science and technology is in the paper records, books and archives, photographs, uh, ephemera, in material culture, in museums, and in the oral histories. Uh, and they can be audio or video histories. Finally, we have the exhibitions that we share with the public, but the, the exhibitions only show a small percentage of our collections. So we now have our digital collections site. Um, and now we have an online presence for researchers. We have a growing amount of born digital materials that we have to deal with. We have to manage and metadata all of this material. We have to provide access to digital materials. We have to do preservation of digital materials. And we also have to preserve websites because now instead of printing uh, general material, people are putting it up on their websites. And the websites go away. So somebody has to preserve these websites. So now our libraries like, like us are having to deal with how we preserve websites. Now, I'll ask Gildo, do we have internet access on this? Do we have internet access on this? If I click on this, I, well, I just wanted to see if I could show you an example. Yeah. Yes. No, I don't need to translate this page. 
Do I? No. Oh, okay. No, 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 okay. <laughs> Maybe it looks funny that way. Oh, wrong thing. Anyway. So, so here's our digital collections. And uh, right now we have about 6,530 materials. And you can search these uh, just from our online and you, uh, site. And if you just do a general search, it'll start pulling up all of the materials we have. And you can also download these for free at high resolution. And you can zoom in at very high resolution on them as well, so you can see the details in them. So, uh, so an, a, li a history of science uh, library needs to be able to have a digital presence in this modern world. Uh, we, it doesn't replace coming to our institute, but it is a nice ability to show things where uh, you can uh, see them remotely and maybe become interested in coming to our, our institute to do research. So in any event, I encourage you to look at that site. Uh, and uh, I didn't go into the fact, and I relate this to here, that we do have an issue now that we're moving into born digital materials. We have to preserve people's emails. We have to preserve people's electronic documents and born digital photographs. There are solutions to that, but often it requires the individual to use an email program that's perhaps open source not proprietary like Microsoft Outlook or something like that. So these are issues that we're starting to deal with. They're not insurmountable. They just require more resources uh, to deal with. Um, so I think what I'd like to do now is just go to, our, uh, go to my conclusions. And I'd say these are some things I'd, I'd like to take away with um, the importance for the future of preserving the history of science and technology. So yes, you can have institutions like ours that preserve, uh, preserve all of the materials, and we, we're nicely supported, but we, need, we can't do it ourselves. So some of the things we need is, is we need to educate scientists and engineers about the value of their records. These are important to be historians and should not be thrown away. But this is not something that is obvious sometimes to people who don't do historical research on their own. So, so it's good to have this educational opportunity. We also uh, know that historians need to work with the libraries, archives, and museums. So we call them LAMs. Uh, the historians must work with us to connect us with the people they know who can donate primary sources to the collection. Historians work with scientists, and they know where these sources are, but they need to get these sources when they're finished with them to the institutions that can save them. We need to conduct oral histories with scientists, engineers, support staff whose stories may be lost and preserve them at an archive somewhere. And scientific research centers and companies must actively preserve their history, either by themselves or in partnership with a separate archive. And we see this in a number of scientific institutions. How do they preserve the scientific data that are, are being produced? Uh, um, Many of the older institutions preserve data on electric, on, on magnetic reels of tape with software that no longer can access them. There is data that is lost now because we no longer have the means to access this data. So if the research centers know that historians want to use data they're working on, these have to be in a format that can be migrated and read by future software. And finally, to let your universities, governments, philanthropists, and the public know that supportive history and science technology lambs are crucial to our future. As I like to say, science has a past, and our future depends on it. So basically, uh, that's my talk. I just want to say that our institute does have a lot of online content because you cannot exist as a 21st century institution without being online presence. Essentially, if you are not online, you do not exist to most people. So we have a website, our digital collection site, our oral history collections, our library catalog, our library subject guides, 
We have a magazine, podcast, and videos. You can all access these. Uh, we have a Tumblr blog called Othmeralia. We have a Twitter account. We're on Facebook. And we are on Instagram. So all of these things uh, you can follow. And uh, we love you to follow us. Finally, I want to say thank you. Uh, feel free to email me or to follow me on Twitter or to uh, check with me with LinkedIn. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And I only covered a portion of the very rich issues of history of science and the heritage and preserving it. Um, but uh, thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't speak too long. That's okay. That's very good. Thank you, Ron. Uh, nós temos ainda cinco minutos <laughs> antes de entregar o auditório aqui. Então, se alguém tiver uma pergunta, que seja muito objetiva, curta, para também ter uma resposta curta. Yes. Uh, on the micro, identify yourself. Uh, uh, identifica. Carlos Filgueiras, uh, professor of chemistry and of history of science. Uh, are you in any way connected with the History of Science Society? Yes, uh, thank you. The, uh, the History of Science Society is uh, an important part of our institution. We're, it's not a direct link, but it's a collegial wow. link. In other words, if you go to the History of Science Society meetings, uh, this year it will be in Utrecht in the Netherlands, uh, we have a presence there, mainly because and I didn't mention this, we give money to, for people to come and do research at our institute. It's a competitive process, but we do give out fellowships and travel grants. And we like to be able to um, inform people of this at, at History of Science Society where historians are located. Also in Philadelphia, directly adjacent to us, well, one block away, is a consortium of history of science, technology, and medicine. Uh, they also give out fellowships to do research at history of science institutions. And one of the ways that our history of science institutions can, can continue to exist is by collaborating. We don't try to do everything ourselves. There are other institutions and societies that will help us. So, so we uh, participate strongly with the History of Science Society, with the Society for the History of Technology, and with the uh, Ameri is it the Association of Society for the History of Medicine. We, we work with all of these people because this is where most of the historians go. We also work with the scientific societies. Uh, I go to the American Chemical Society meetings because the, there are chemists who do history there. So we also meet chemists, scientists who do history, and we do historians who do science. They do not always collaborate or go to the same meetings or publish in the same journals. So we, we work with them. Mais uma pergunta? <laughs> Ivan Lesky, uh, PhD in social history. Collecting is also selecting. With new technologies, that demands the new technologies to produce uh, knowledge. How, to, uh, how should we establish criteria to collect what is really important? Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. The, uh, this is an issue that is uh, not just specifically for history of science, but for archives and generals in essence. And as we get into more of a digital online world, we do have to have different criteria. Um, and not that I have the answers immediately for you, but the issues are where is, in, the, in issues of history and science, where is science and technology being discussed? Where is it actually being conducted? And for instance, we collected laboratory notebooks of scientists. Well, now laboratory notebooks are done electronically using software. So we have to be able to select these materials and to be able to provide access to them. I see much of science uh, education being done on social media. So 
you have to decide whether you're going to collect the tweets and the, uh, then the photographs that are shared on that. And this is a larger issue. The Library of Congress in the United States began collecting the uh, archives of Twitter, for instance. But they realized quickly they can't quite do all of that. But you know, can we focus on very specific things, websites of scientific institutions? These have to be selected as well. And the criteria may just depend on uh, which institutions have had a bigger impact than, than others. Because it does get to the heart of, of our general problem is we cannot save everything. And this was the issue in earlier times as well as now. And so, so collaboration and criteria have to be determined. And sometimes that's done through the Society of American Archivists. They'll create general guidelines, but every institution will have their own guidelines. So it's an issue we face, an issue that we cannot um, solve completely, but we will, you know, we're, de we're dealing with these issues right now. Um, so I don't have a good answer for you except that we're trying. <laughs> okay, uma pergunta final. Okay, uh, here in the back. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Heraclio Tavares. I uh, actually, uh, I am at the uh, Physics Institute right now, and I, I have a really uh, direct question. Uh, do you have any kind of suggestion to the young uh, historian of science that are beginning their careers right now? Do I have any suggestions for a young historian beginning the career? Um, I would say that uh, the important thing is to get connected with a network of other historians of science um, to try to see if at all possible to go to meetings or to work online with some of the colleagues in other countries and other places to find funding to maybe go to a society conference where you can present a paper, where you can meet other people, and find out where the discipline is heading. If you stay at one institution and just work within that institution, you get a very narrow view of what the discipline is like and what the job market is like. So uh, it's not cheap, but I would say if you can invest time and resources into attending a scientific, an international scientific conference where your paper is accepted, this will make a big difference in finding new colleagues, new friends, and uh, potentially learning a little bit more about how your, your interests in history match with the interests in history elsewhere in the world. Um, it, it's really about uh, being connected uh, and not insular. And to be interested in, in talking to a larger uh, audience than just your colleagues in the, in the academy. See if your work can have a broad impact uh, see if you can connect with a library or a museum that engages with the public so that you can do something so your knowledge can be uh, brought to a bigger audience as well. Okay, thank you, Rao, again. Uh, thank you. Bem, agora, muito rapidamente, eu gostaria de agradecer a todos que puderam é, comparecer no nosso congresso. É, esta conferência... É, foi gravada, é, vai para o YouTube, you'll be there, ok? É, bem, bem rapidamente, assim como todas as outras sessões é, gerais que nós tivemos no Congresso. Então, eu espero que vocês tenham aproveitado e gostado desses três dias aqui conosco e desejo, então, um bom fim de semana para vocês.